Hello everybody, welcome to today's video. We're going to talk about a number of things today. We're going to talk about vMotion, the basic structure and what vMotion is. We're going to cover how vMotion can be used in different ways with cross vCenter vMotion, long distance vMotion, some other capabilities like storage vMotion. And we're going to progress with that and into what we call distributed resource scheduler where we can see how distributed resource scheduler can help balance our workload and help improve availability of our services within the data center. We're also going to cover off a little bit about what we call distributed power management. So I want to talk to you about moving virtual machines around. We use a couple of different terms. When we talk about moving a virtual machine that's powered off, we use the term cold migration. What about if a virtual machine was still powered on? Wouldn't it be really neat if we could move a VM while it was live and running on the network and users were still connected to the services and applications that were running in that machine? We sometimes call this a hot migration or what we term at VMware vMotion. And obviously vMotion, the term, implies virtual machine movement around the infrastructure, vMotion. So VMware vMotion allows for live migration of virtual machines between compatible ESXi hosts. Compatibility is determined based on a number of factors, including CPU, network, and storage access. And we can migrate virtual machines between hosts, so from one host to another. We can migrate a virtual machine between clusters, between data stores, New to the, the latest release in vSphere 6 is we have the ability to also migrate between networks, between vCenters, and over long distances. And I'll expand on those in the next couple of slides. So vMotion involves transferring the entire execution state of a virtual machine from one host to another while it's running live. This happens over a high-speed network or the vMotion network as we term it. The execution state of a virtual machine really kind of associates with everything that you'd think about a virtual machine that it takes to run the VM, right? Its virtual device state, including the state of its CPU, its network, its disk adapters, VGA, including connectivity with external devices, including networking and SCSI devices, and the virtual machine's physical memory. And probably the biggest challenge is the physical memory because if you think about it, those other services that are associated with a virtual machine are logically associated through configuration files. So the biggest issue is keeping that application running so a user doesn't lose connectivity to the application. And there's a couple of different aspects to this which I'll expand on here in a few minutes. So we need to copy the virtual machine's physical memory. When we migrate these virtual machines, generally we can do it so fast that only a ping is lost or a packet is lost. And users won't even know when this occurs because TCP automatically handles packet resequencing. So if you dropped a packet, that packet would automatically be resequenced by TCP. And of course, the user may experience just a slight freeze in the screen, kind of like if you um, if you use cable TV or um, satellite TV, when when the satellite signal pauses just, just for a fraction of a second, while the next image comes down and, and updates, and that's uh, ultimately kind of the worst user experience that one would experience from a vMotion perspective. Typically, it happens when the user doesn't even notice it actually is completed. With a standard vMotion, we first create a virtual machine process at the destination. So you can see in this diagram, I've got two ESXi hosts, ESX host number one, ESX host number two. You'll see I've got end users connected to a virtual machine, um, virtual machine A as an example, and they're connected in over the production network. We have a separate network that is used for vMotion. And this is where we're going to copy network services from one host to the other in order to get consistency. So obviously, to move the virtual machine from host number one to host number two, we've got a th couple of things that we need to work through. First thing is we're going to register that new virtual machine on the new host. Now, as you would expect with file locking, 
we can't have two virtual machines running at the same time being the same virtual machine. Obviously, this would lead to a disaster from a networking standpoint, um, data corruption and, and all, courts, all sorts of user interruption. So we begin, once we've registered the machine, then we begin a copy of the memory from the source to the destination. Now we do this iteratively. That is that we go and copy memory and then we go back and copy bits that may have changed in the meantime, tracked in what we call a memory bitmap. And then we go back and do it again and again until we're left with a very, very small amount of memory left to copy. So then we pause the original source virtual machine that was running on host number one. We make that final copy of the changes in memory. Um, and this is the last bit of memory that keeps changing constantly. And this is what we call a checkpoint. So once that pause on the original source machine occurs and we've copied over the last bit of most active memory or the last checkpoint, we start that second virtual machine very quickly. And this generally takes less than a second where a single ping is dropped. Um, and once we have cut over and become live on the virtual machine on host number two, the last step is to do a reverse ARP broadcast where that virtual machine advertises its path through its network address in a typical switch cam table and advertises back out to the physical world so the end user, the client can connect and find the new path over the network is now through host number two. Of course, once that is complete, we're live on the new virtual machine and the original source process or the original virtual machine is stopped and deregistered and removed from host number one. So this happens, of course, much quicker than I can explain it in this video um, as we go through these various steps. So that is vMotion in a nutshell. And then we are running live off the new host, new virtual machine off the new host. Um, and of course, the end user doesn't experience any connectivity. Like I said, the worst that experience is that slight uh, screen freeze for a fraction of a second, then the virtual machine continues to run. And that's only if TCP drops a packet. On good networks where you don't even drop a packet, um, that is essentially seamless to the end user. They don't know that you've just moved the virtual machine. So the motion allows us to achieve some fantastic things when it comes to managing infrastructure. As you can imagine, vMotion will be very beneficial for maintenance activities. If we needed to move all the VMs off a particular host, so we could take that host out and, and do maintenance on it, maybe add some more memory, add some more disk capacity, something like that, vMotion would be very helpful. What about patching? If we needed to patch a host, which is um, obviously required from time to time, so if we could move all the VMs off that host using vMotion and patch that host while nothing's running on it, we can mitigate a lot of the risk. So you can see vMotion is a very powerful capability introduced back um, way back in 2003. vMotion has been a cornerstone piece of our availability management and is really the foundation for a lot of additional services that we're going to talk about when we get into the availability portion of this topic. So in addition to vMotion, we have the ability to run what we call a storage vMotion. Now in a vMotion, you saw in that previous diagram, we're moving a virtual machine. In a vMotion, in that previous diagram, as you saw, we're moving a virtual machine from ESX host number one to ESX host number two. So the virtual machine is changing hosts. When we run a storage vMotion, the virtual machine actually stays on the same host, but what we're doing in the background is we're changing where all the source files for that virtual machine are located. In other words, we're moving that source file from one data store to another, or you can even expand this out from one storage array to another. And allow, in, you can even expand this into a storage array, moving from one storage array to another to help with storage-based migrations. 
So with storage vMotion, we create a second virtual machine that points to the destination directory when we initiate a storage vMotion. Then we copy the files from the source directory to the destination directory. Any changes that occur during copy are written to both directories. And this means as soon as we finish copying the VMDK to the destination, we can start using it because all the information is there. And we use what we call a data mover to copy the files. It can offload the copy to the storage array if your storage arrays are VI capable. VMware storage array based integration. What that means instead of using the data mover service inside the ESX kernel, we can use the storage array to move data within the storage array, which is much quicker. And the mirror driver then duplicates any writes to the destination during copy. Once complete, the new virtual machine is started. We read and write from the destination data store. And of course, as a cleanup, the old data store files or the old files that resided on the old data store are then removed and that completes the storage vMotion. So very similar to vMotion, storage vMotion allows us to change storage infrastructure on the back end and migrate from a different data store from one LUN to another or even to different performance tiers of storage or a completely different storage platform altogether without any downtime. And this feature, of course, is very beneficial for storage upgrades. Wouldn't it be neat if we could vMotion from a data center in, let's say, New York to a data center in Los Angeles? Or in Europe, maybe a data center in London to a data center in Dublin, Ireland, or somewhere like that, where you've got close proximity to um, your secondary data center. So this is what we call long distance vMotion. We have made a number of enhancements to the vMotion TCP IP stack in order to tolerate higher latency network links. And we can go and tolerate up to 150 milliseconds round trip time. Now latency is a factor of how many routers you cross in your infrastructure. So if you went say 10 miles and cross seven different routers, your latency would be higher than going 100 miles and crossing one router, obviously. So this is not a physical distance limitation. It is a latency limitation. And of course, it's designed to support that consistent vMotion guarantee that we provide within a data center that is highly connected. So we've made a number of enhancements to the TCP IP stack and taking advantage of a number of tuning capabilities with batched RPCs, TCP congestion window handoff, and really enhance that stack to tolerate those higher latencies. And as a result, it gives you the ability to vMotion across data centers, physical data centers in different locations. That's what we call long distance vMotion. So we talked about being able to vMotion over long distances. That really implies that we're changing different data centers and therefore we should consider networking with regards to vMotion. So what if ESX hosts are in different subnets? What are our limitations with vMotion when it comes to that type of connectivity? Well, we have the ability to vMotion across layer three network boundaries. Now, there's a couple of limitations to this and I'll explain as I go through this next slide. First of all, we can run vMotion. That vMotion network that we talked about earlier on can be used across layer three network boundaries. Now, our vMotion kernel has a network stack that offers virtualization and it has its own gateway and being able to use that default gateway on the vMotion network allows us to redirect traffic across layer three network segments or have that traffic routed between two different data centers. But what about our virtual machines? So we can vMotion across layer three. Does it make sense for the network to move across layer three boundaries. Well, obviously if you change networks that that virtual machine was connected to, then 
you would have some reconvergence of the network infrastructure that would be necessary. And we couldn't necessarily achieve that without incurring a larger downtime period that would be visible to the end user and to the customer. So in order to achieve the motion and not have that connectivity lost, this is where we get into stretch layer three networking. So layer three vMotion network can use layer three boundaries and route between different network segments, whereas layer two is necessary from our virtual machines perspective in order for users to remain connected to that service and not have any impacted downtime. DRS clusters also have a couple of cluster requirements in order to support DRS. All our ESX hosts on layer two or all our hosts need to be on layer three from a vMotion network standpoint. The running of mixed mode is not supported with DRS. Also with layer two adjacency, fault tolerance is not supported and distributed power management using wake on LAN is not supported without layer two adjacency. So what if ESX hosts have different virtual switches? Can we cross virtual switch boundaries or can we cross network boundaries is effectively what we're saying here. So vMotion is available to us across virtual switches. We can migrate and vMotion from a standard switch to another standard switch. We can migrate from a standard switch to a distributed virtual switch. We can also vMotion from a distributed virtual switch to another distributed virtual switch. The only limitation here is that we can't vMotion from a distributed virtual switch back to a standard switch. So when we migrate a virtual machine, of course, the port metadata associated with that port is being carried with that virtual machine. So if you imagine going from a standard switch, which doesn't have really metadata associated with the port up to a distributed virtual switch, the DVS is actually carry metadata more significant than our standard switches. So obviously we can progress upwards, if you will, in associating metadata. But once we've got metadata attached, we can't migrate it back to a standard virtual switch because standard switches don't support the attachment of metadata. So what, what about vCenters? Can we migrate between different vCenters? Aren't they different manage pro management properties? Well, previously this was a limitation, but as of vSphere 6, we do have the ability to migrate between different vCenter server boundaries. So we can simultaneously change the compute host, we can change storage, we can change networks, and we can change vCenters that run the virtual machine. And we can do this without requiring shared storage. It works with local as well as metro and long distance vMotion. Now, when we migrate a virtual machine from one vCenter to another, there's certain things that are preserved with that virtual machine. The virtual machine's unique VM identifier, we call a UUID, is preserved. All the historical events and alarms and task history associated with that virtual machine are also transported across to the new vCenter. And there is still solution interoperability. So things like the virtual machine's high availability properties gets preserved, as well as DRS uh, anti-affinity rules are also honored when we migrate the virtual machine. Now, in order to achieve this, these two vCenters actually have to know about each other from certain security contexts. So your vSphere web client requires the same single sign-on domain and the API does require single sign-on domain consistency between these two vCenters in order to achieve cross vCenter vMotion. So wouldn't it be neat if we could take advantage of storage replication when we run a vMotion? If you think about it, when we migrate from one vCenter to another, we're connecting to completely different infrastructure. And when we migrate, as I mentioned in the last couple of slides, we're, of course, going to have to copy that virtual disk. And, of course, the hard drive replication of a large file is going to take the most time to complete. So we can take advantage of technologies like virtual volumes and use replication to avoid that disk copy when we run a vMotion. 
So through the use of virtual volumes in active active async replication, we can switch the mode, switch it over to synchronous, start the migration, which will prepare the destination ESX host for virtual volume binding, switch from async to synchronous replication, replicate the data, complete virtual volume binding on the destination ESX host, mount that virtual machine, bring it live on the network, just like we would in a normal vMotion, and then switch back to asynchronous replication, preparing for the next progressive migration on that virtual machine. Using storage replication, we can speed up this process of vMotion and minimize the amount of time it takes to complete a vMotion, and certainly minimize the risk of an impact of migration. So just to give you a graphic of what we've covered in the sessions with vMotion, if we wanted to change complete infrastructure, as long as these two vCenters are linked to each other and share a single sign-on domain infrastructure, then we could migrate from one host and one infrastructure to another. So we select the virtual machine that we want to migrate. That destination host then gets the virtual machine world registered as it would in a normal vMotion. The next step is to do a storage vMotion. And this is where we could take advantage of that storage replication solution that we just talked about. Then run a network vMotion where we reconnect the virtual NIC to a different network in the new destination host. And then finally, register that virtual machine with the vCenter instance that is in the destination. Of course, it becomes fully managed. All the events in the log history go with that virtual machine, including its HA and its DRS properties, as I mentioned earlier. And then, of course, the source virtual machine is then removed from the original source vCenter, and it is migrated successfully. So I think vMotion is one of the best products that we have, and it has been running very successfully for many, many years. And it makes sense that we can take advantage of the capability of vMotion to improve the way that we do business and certainly improve availability of our infrastructure. And we can do this through the use of what we call DRS, Distributed Resource Scheduler, which I've mentioned a couple of times already. So DRS is a technology that monitors the load and resource utilization within a VMware cluster and uses vMotion to rebalance those virtual machine workloads across all hosts within a cluster. DRS also includes what we call distributed power management, which allows hosts to be evacuated and powered off during periods of low utilization. So DRS literally leverages vMotion functionality to migrate virtual machines, and our cluster can be configured in three different tiers of service, if you will. In a manual configuration, when you go to power on a virtual machine, DRS will recommend which host this virtual machine should be powered on. And then any ongoing vMotion recommendations to rebalance the cluster will also require administrative approval, both on power on and vMotion on an ongoing basis. In partially automated, DRS acts automatically and powers on virtual machines without requiring the approval of an administrator. Basically, it looks at load and selects the best host to run the virtual machine and will automatically power on that virtual machine. But then, if it recommends future vMotions, it will not automatically move that virtual machine. But of course, in fully automated mode, DRS will automatically act on recommendations for power on and vMotion and will seek to rebalance the nodes in your cluster to try and get a, a more even distribution of resources. So if you think about DRS, DRS has some other features that um, I haven't highlighted in this slide, but if we could put a host into maintenance mode, we could leverage DRS to automatically move those VMs off that host so we could patch that host or maybe do upgrades on the host. If we had vMotion compatibility across all hosts within a cluster, we could work through that cluster in an automated patching model where DRS helps us move VMs off a host to get it to a point where it's ready to patch and we can reboot that host as necessary without impacting virtual machines and it will progressively work its way through the cluster and help us achieve higher availability. 
So just look at DRS from a high level standpoint and seeing what it does for us. You can see in this example, I've got three ESX hosts. Host number one has six virtual machines. Host number two has one virtual machine. And host number three has two virtual machines. So you can see we've got an imbalance across these hosts. I go out and enable DRS and DRS in a fully automated mode will then rebalance these virtual machines across these hosts to try and get a little bit more even workload distribution. And uh, in a very simplistic view, you can see here DRS has redistributed virtual machines and I've got now three VMs on each one of my hosts and a more even distribution of workload. Distributed power management works similarly however it focuses on power savings so if the normal production workload looks something like this diagram we've got three hosts and i've got virtual machines distributed across those hosts during a low activity period let's say late in the evenings between 10 and 4 o'clock in the morning is your window where not much happens in your work environment distributed power management would determine that with the workload dropping in these virtual machines, that we don't need all of these hosts to carry the workload in those low peak activity periods. So in this case, DRS and distributed power management would work together. DPM would instruct DRS to vMotion all those VMs onto two nodes and a two node cluster putting the third node essentially into standby or into sleep mode. DPM would then detect when the workload picks up and normal activity starts to pick up and then would go back to its normal function and bring that host out of standby before the business day kicked in. So thanks for watching today's video. I hope you found today's topics of vMotion, being able to vMotion within a data center, being able to vMotion across different data centers, taking advantage of those WAN capabilities of vMotion now, the ability to use storage with vMotion to really complement and speed up that vMotion process across vCenters and across data center boundaries. We're going to continue on this theme of availability in the next video. We're going to talk about VMware High Availability. We're going to cover VMware Fault Tolerance and how those two products can help you improve availability. We're also going to cover off what we call Content Library. And this is a tool that allows us to distribute media files and virtual machine templates to make your life a little bit easier in the enterprise. So again, thanks for joining today's session. We'll talk to you soon.